How you doing, guys? Uh, David Patterson here with Dell. Uh, I have uh, co-presenters uh, Rick Pioso, who's also a, a Dell employee, and Akalash from Intel. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the new business unit that I work for at Dell. Uh, then we're going to get into uh, the Intel product that we're integrating uh, as one of our solutions. And uh, then Rick is going to uh, talk about uh, how we are leveraging Ironic to do some uh, zero-touch provisioning uh, of edge nodes. And then I'm going to summarize and uh, take it from there. So um, as I said, we're part of a, a, a new business unit at Dell where we're uh, focusing on uh, where telco and cloud and edge converge, right? Uh, the, the main offering that we've come out with as a group as we've grown over the year is uh, Dell Services Edge. Um, we'll go through the, uh, the Smart Edge overview, and then we're going to talk about, uh, Rick's going to talk about DHCP Pixie challenges at the edge and how Ironic can help. And I'll give you an overview of the solution and then Q&A and uh, references. So as I said, uh, Telco Systems Business, uh, uh, Edge Solutions, of which I'm the lead, is uh, we're heavily focused on uh, mobility uh, edge-based solutions. So Dell Services Edge, uh, the, the first offering we came out with is based on Intel Smart Edge. Uh, Red Hat OpenShift is running the Smart Edge controller. And we're using uh, Airspan 5G CBRS radios and Litmus Edge is the uh, IoT platform. Uh, we're also moving forward with a variety of other uh, private mobility solutions that are in early stages of, de of Define. Uh, I have two tracks that we're just finishing up Define phase on that will be, uh, we'll start working on soon. Uh, all about uh, adding IoT, ML, uh, machine, machine learning, digital twinning, inferencing, and new use cases are being added all the time. So one of the big challenges with the group is that we have people that come from the telco world that uh, have you know, 20 years of telco experience and know all of these protocols and are familiar with all these appliances, but they don't necessarily know uh, virtualization, containerization, you know, massive scaling, zero temperature provisioning, DevOps, infrastructure as code, all of this stuff that uh, cloud developers like myself know. Uh, and on the other side, we have people like me who come from a cloud background and telco, a lot of this stuff is uh, alphabet soup. Uh, all of these standards like 3GPP, which is a combination of a bunch of different organizations, including Etsy. Uh, then we have uh, 5G stack, which has a bunch of disaggregation flavors. Uh, we're using a 7.2 dot split right now for, uh, for our solution, but there's split six and uh, others coming down the road. Uh, there's also a lot of competing standards like ORAN Alliance, Small, Smell, uh, Small Cell Forum, who's responsible for split six, uh, Intel FlexRAN, uh, and uh, getting my head around uh, Spectrum and some of the terminology around there like G node B, E node B, all of this stuff uh, is challenging. So uh, uh, both the team, uh, from both of those angles, this has been the challenge is like, we're, we're both learning. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's been a challenge, but it's also been very educational. So the convergence of telecommunications and computing. Uh, it's, as we can see, uh, the cloud and edge and IoT, all this stuff is going to be massive, right? Uh, edge and 5G will be key enablers. Uh, uh, Wi-Fi is not going to go away, uh, but 5G is definitely going to be uh, uh, a big part of uh, the new ge next generation of computing. Um, security, first and foremost. Uh, <clears throat> Um, use, use cases that are coming are, are legion, right? There's just thousands and thousands of things that you can think of doing once you have this kind of connectivity and these kind of compute sources. 
Um, so, you know, you're talking about uh, augmented reality, scene intelligence, uh, ML, IE, uh, autonomous everything. Uh, and our group's first major offering is uh, uh, an effort by Dell, uh, Intel, the Smart Edge product, Red Hat OpenShift, and we're using Airspan for radio equipment, uh, specifically their 5G CBRS and the Litmus uh, IoT platform. Uh, and the, the current release is Dell uh, Services Edge 1.2. I'll hand it off to Akalash. He's going to go over Smart Edge. Right. Thanks, David. So I'm, I'm Akhilesh. I work for Intel, and particularly on the, on the uh, product Intel's Smart Edge. So here, um, to put in perspective, um, Intel Smart Edge is a, is, is a software solution that runs on any Intel platform. And, um, and we are partnering with Dell to enable edge computing solution to also you know, any customers that, that they want to deploy the infrastructure. And in this particular case, um, f this is an edge solution for specifically for, for telecom applications. Um, so here, the challenge that we have with, uh, with the edge solution is, is to deal with multiple software components. So it may be with orchestrators, maybe with the workloads, how to, how to draw the you know, analytics and ha act on it. So in this, in this particular solution that what um, our colleague will be, will be showcasing is to deploy the solution, uh, and deploy and manage. So in our case, um, where, let's say we, if, if we take this product and want to deploy this on any of our existing um, enterprise or let's say private customer. So somebody, somebody has to manually go boot up an ISO. So the solution itself is an ISO, the, the operating system based off of Linux. And, and also it, it works on the principles of Kubernetes to interact with an orchestrator. So somebody has to go and put down all these components and configure them, uh, mainly for these telecom solutions like VRANs. You know, if, it is, if it is NFV, you have to make sure that all the networking components are set properly. Um, and also, uh, since this is a, this, uh, we have Smart Edge open and also Smart Edge commercial solutions. So depending on what kind of flavors customers choose, um, they, um, we have to make sure that when the ISO boots up, the node instance, you have to register with the controller and you have to manage from a remote controller. So all this process, the manual process involves generating tokens and then exchanging with the controller and, uh, and, and make sure the handshake happens, you know, um, the licensing is all met. So the, the, in this process, there's a lot of manual intervention. So what Dell is trying to do is integrate in, into the framework with the zero touch provisioning using Ironic. So that seems like what we, where, do we, where we want to be. And uh, you know, this is, some of these slides are um, just, uh, just giving us a software overview of what the Smart Edge is. So under, this is the, you know, um, we use the community-based solutions in, uh, closely integrated with, with Kubernetes. So the, the underlying service that we want to deliver is, you know, um, is to have is to have what in, a, in any cloud native deployments that you have in general cloud we want to bring that to the edge and it's also we want to make everything less compact and, um, and minimal like any any uh, devops engineer or any any it engineer wants to deal with these components they ha they want it to be at the very minimal set of any technical interfaces like they just come in with a minimal set of knowledge and, and, and to be able to use, derive these features right off of the software and the hardware platform that exists. Um, so one, one of our key, um, the, um, if you ask like, who is being um, the primary recipient of this product, is, is who, whoever wants this 5G connectivity, um, because it's a, the product is meant for edge uh, customers, and whoever wants to use computing at the close proximity of the user, has to use um, use this um, you know solution and being edge close proximity to the user, which means the user is always having less knowledge about all the management char characteristics of, of the product, right? So I'm going to skip skim through this very quickly. So we just want to um, emphasize here is that the, uh, at present the product product does not have uh, zero test provisioning feature as per se, and it has a lot of manual intervention to bring it up, to manage the node. 
And one of the gap, and also what we are trying to fill from, from this effort, is to manage the workload, which um, um, primarily the RAN. You know, when, when we bring up the RAN service, we have to bring up all the radio, radio software components along with that 5G core so that the end-to-end -end connectivity can work. So the zero-touch provisioning will enable us to bring up the node, bring up the workload, all of it in one single, um, one single input, and then one zero-touch. So we'll skim through. Um, and w uh, the other benefit of using Smart Edge, I mean, w um, is to have the, you know, the underlying hardware features transparently gets exposed to all the software layers. So the orchestration doesn't have to figure out okay, which, which feature exists, which doesn't, you know, which feature doesn't, doesn't exist. So we want, we want to be transparent so application can, when, when it lands, it can know what exists and what not exists. So we, we also want to you know, translate a little bit of uh, burden from the orchestration to the workload itself so they can dynamically switch. So just, just to make sure um, you know, the product works best for the edge solution and edge, edge applications and also to be in the ecosystem of cloud um, and, ha and derive all the benefits from it. So I'm going to hand over to um, uh, Rick, who is going to have that more technical details of zero touch provisioning. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thanks. <laughs> so um, I'd like to uh, discuss how Ironic can help with uh, zero touch provisioning and the deployment of uh, the workload. So I think what's um, most um, significant in terms of its ability to assist is that I, the Ironic community has adopted um, the modern Redfish RESTful API web technology for managing bare metal. Um, the Ironic um, code base offers a number of feature functions um, that can be used um, to zero touch provision um, a system. Uh, those include um, inspection, which is typically out of band uh, with the assistance of a baseboard management controller, um, BMC, as well as in-band introspection by booting uh, typically a RAM disk. Uh, also firmware update, either day one or day two, uh, can be performed out of band uh, with Redfish. Uh, Burn-in, so a lot of, a lot of um, Houses, a lot, of, uh, a lot of organizations, when they get a new delivery of hardware, before they put it into production, they want to burn it in to ensure that it's stable and reliable and reduce um, uh, maintenance headaches later on. That can be done through ironic cleaning. Uh, the next thing that uh, ironic can, can assist with is configuring the BIOS settings, which is not to be confused with the, the BIOS firmware, which you might update, but actually the various settings that a BIOS will offer um, to basically tune your system to your particular workload. Um, things like uh, uh, virtualization is a, a very common one, of course. Uh, <clears throat> you can also create a RAID configuration um, out of band, um, or in band for that matter, uh, and, and the out of band version uses Redfish to do that. Um, you can assert a, a boot mode um, so you could either use legacy BIOS or UFI. And also UFI Secure Boot is a relatively new feature that was added um, to uh, the Ironic code base. Um, of course, Ironic, after deploying the operating system, needs to be able to um, inform the system the boot from it. Um, so throughout the various workflows that Ironic supports, um, it's able to set the boot device uh, to use on the next boot. Uh, and then more recently, we've added telemetry uh, to the Ironic uh, feature set, and uh, of course, there's more. So a, a major feature uh, that is is very useful for this um, for this edge environment is virtual media boot. Uh, it's a feature that's offered by Redfish. Um, it's more secure and reliable um, than the uh, traditional method that Ironics use, which has been Pixie and iPixie. And it's, it's especially well suited for um, the unreliable communications environment uh, or environments that edge deployments often, often find themselves in. Um, the way it works is that the baseband or baseboard management controller 
um, is informed to insert uh, the virtual media. And when it's in informed to do that, it's given a URL um, to go ahead and visit and get the actual content of the media. Uh, so it does that and then presents it to the system with the assistance of BIOS as if it's an actual CD-ROM uh, or a, um, uh, a USB stick, thumb drive, or even a floppy. Uh, so to the system, it looks like real physical, um, like a real physical device, and then the system can be asked to boot from it. Um, virtual media boot can be used to boot either RAM disks, uh, which is basically the replacement um, of the traditional I, um, Pixie or iPixie boot of the ironic Python agent, or more recently, it can actually boot um, a RAM disk that represents an actual instance um, operating system environment, which is how we've actually used it um, with our, our work uh, with the uh, Mech. And what's important to note is that this virtual media boot feature is foundational. It, it's required by the other features that I'm gonna go ahead and discuss now. So the two features that we've used um, that are built on top of virtual media boot are layer three DHCP-less booting of a RAM disk and RAM disk deployment. So layer three DHCP uh, booting of a RAM disk eliminates the need for both TFTP and DHCP. Um, you basically configure a static IP network configuration on the bare metal node object that Ironic manages, and that is applied um, by a Cloud init or Glean. And as I said, it's built on top of virtual media. The next one is RAM disk deployment. So RAM disk deployment, um, in that case, the ironic deployment, um, it, it's, a, it's an ironic deployment approach that does not actually write the instance operating system um, onto non-volatile storage, like a hard disk or a RAID volume, but rather just leaves it in RAM. And so the, the intended work, um, workloads for this uh, feature um, are two. Uh, those that have a need for just ephemeral workloads, um, such as high performance computing and scientific computing, or, and this is the way we've used it, um, is the deployment of an instance OS, which in turn will, will write the actual um, workload to the disk. Um, so you boot a RAM disk, which then um, by virtual media, uh, which then in turn looks at the system, figures it out, and installs the operating system and any other content that it wants on that system, and then that instruct, in, instructs Ironic to boot from that subsequently into the future. So I've gone ahead and broken out the various commands um, through the staging of what we did. Um, there, there were four, basically four, four stages. The first was to create a development environment. And the, the, develop, the development environment that we decided to use was Bifrost. Um, it's a really simple to use tool. Um, it's Ansible uh, based uh, and includes a bunch of playbooks for installing and executing, uh, well, for installing Ironic in a standalone mode and then using that installation to execute common work, uh, workflows from an ironic perspective. It was very easy to use. I highly recommend it if you're interested in um, you know, experimenting with ironic and using it in your, uh, in your environments. Uh, the next thing um, was to actually create a, a, an ironic bare metal node to manage. So the first command, uh, which is multi-line there, is to create the node and um, the emphasis is that we used one of the two drivers that highly support Redfish. Um, we use the iDRAC driver, which um, is used to manage a Dell EMC Power Edge server. There's also a community-based Redfish driver, which is called Redfish. They, bo they both support these features that, that I've been describing. And um, the other thing was to support the, um, uh, the RAM disk boot uh, we said force persistent boot device never, uh, so it, it only boots once from that initial RAM disk 
that then looks at the system and deploys the final workload on the disk. Um, and then the, the boot interface was set to IDRAC Redfish Virtual Media. Uh, that's important, of course. And then the deploy interface is RAM disk. And the final step there is to put it in a manageable state so that you can do the rest of the things that you want to do with the system. So the, the third bullet is about configuring layer three and DHCP less for inspection. So we used it to inspect the system and find out about its capabilities. Um, the, first, the first step is to set the static network configuration information on the node object. And then the second one is to perform the inspection of the system. And then finally, um, there's deployment. And um, the first step there is to say, please don't automatically clean the system. Um, cleaning can be used if you want, but we, we didn't use it in our work. Um, it can be used to do things like configure BIOS settings, RAID settings, burn in, those kinds of things. And then we provide the, the node for deployment, and um, we set the source um, for, the, um, for the RAM disk image to be HTTP and we give the location as to where it could be found on the web, and then we say, deploy it, and it goes ahead and deploys. So I'd like to hand it back to David. Sure. Yeah. So the work that Rick did was uh, very useful. Um, before um, we did this integration with uh, with Bifrost, it was a um, you know very manual process, and uh, in fact, typical uh, smart edge rollouts, if they're doing a, a large deployment, is second touch. So they'll take it, ship the boxes to uh, maybe a third party, and they they will burn the bits onto the box. Uh, this will allow us to do it in a more zero touch provisioning manner. Uh, and in the latest version of Smart Edge, uh, and there's two pieces of Smart Edge. There's the Edge node itself, and then there's the uh, controller, which is running on OpenShift. So Edge node 5.6, they added a new API call, which is factory, uh, which allows you to pass in an activation token. These activation tokens uh, uh, come directly from Intel, uh, and they're you know, very secure. Uh, and then the next thing uh, is they have set it up so that there's a default FQDN uh, for the controller, uh, and you can use that to, uh, in your own DNS server, to automatically map uh, to a name record that is your, your actual uh, FQD, FQDN for the controller. Um, so this takes us that much closer to zero touch for the current version uh, of SmartEdge. These things were just, we just got the bits last week. So it's, it's brand new and it's, uh, it's very useful. Uh, state diagram, I don't know how clear it is, but uh, it basically narrowed it from there uh, to here. So there's uh, a, a lot less interaction. Uh, the, we do need to still make one call to the discovery service, which is out on the web. Uh, but it will just return the, the same constant that uh, I, I mentioned there in uh, number one and number two there, that one. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that's what's, that's what's enabled us to get that much closer to zero touch. Uh, the one piece that we cannot do yet is um, uh, um, the... In final enrollment and entitlements, that's the word I was looking for, I apologize. The entitlements is a manual process because once you activate the node and register it with the controller, uh, entitlements are uh, handled by direct interaction with Intel. So uh, the emphasis is all about security with Smart Edge. So it might sound, sound kind of cumbersome, but uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a very secure platform. Uh, it also includes TPM support, uh, and it, you know, it's very, very secure. Uh, sometimes it's actually difficult to work with it's so secure because you can't even really get into the edge node uh, without getting a token uh, from uh, uh, Intel representative. 
So uh, that might sound bad, but on the other side, it is, uh, it's very secure. Uh, in our example, we're doing uh, just a single node uh, deployment of the Smart Edge control, uh, controller just to a VM. Uh, but in our release, we're deploying uh, the controller to Red Hat OpenShift 4.8. Uh, so uh, Intel, uh, it's been, I don't know, about nine months or so, that worked with us on uh, disaggregating all of the services that were deployed uh, via VM uh, into Helm charts and containers. So we're the first ones to get a uh, you know, Kubernetes-based Smart Edge controller. It was one of the big, the big things that we got with this release. Uh, the edge nodes we used was what I had on hand, which was the PowerEdge XE2420s. Uh, they are the previous generation of edge nodes, and uh, I believe will be end of life pretty soon. Um, the actual RA, though, is uh, supporting the, the, the next gen XR11, XR12, uh, which is uh, even shallower uh, than the XC2420 and uh, supports uh, more modern CPUs. Uh, also, they can be uh, pre-configured to have front-facing or rear-facing ports, so they can support a, a variety of uh, different environments. So the actions we took was we uh, leveraged Ironix uh, boot from virtual media uh, for uh, um, doing the actual laying down of the operating system. Uh, and activated the node via the new REST call I mentioned, uh, and then we need to imply the entitlements manually. Uh, and then uh, enrollment is complete. Uh, whereas before, in the standard process, it was uh, we would install the ISO uh, uh, as, well, you still attach it to the BMC as virtual media, but it was a manual process. Then we would have to get in touch with uh, Intel to get a activation token. Uh, then we would uh, go through an HTML form and apply the token. Uh, so we get to skip all of that stuff. And we don't have to enter the FQDN anymore. So we've taken out a lot of the, the manual steps. The uh, entitlements is the only thing that's going to remain uh, um, uh, as a manual process because the node has to be registered with the controller before you can even get the entitlement. So that's going to stay the way it is. So uh, to wrap it up, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, our release, Dell Services Edge 1.2. Uh, it's, it's based on the latest uh, uh, version of Smart Edge. Uh, it's you know, zero trust, uh, including uh, TPM support. Uh, and it's a, full, it's a Mac, uh, as well as a full orchestration platform. Um, we, uh, you know, most of the time in the lab, we're deploying, right, and we're provisioning. Uh, but what uh, workloads I've seen people do with the uh, Smart Edge is, is pretty remarkable. Some of the machine learning and inferencing and all of these things, uh, it's uh, pretty mind-blowing, some of the workloads I've seen run on Smart Edge. Uh, again, we're using OpenShift 4.8 for the controller host. And uh, we're also partnered with Litmus Edge for uh, providing IoT. Uh, Velo Cloud uh, SD WAN is also an option, uh, and uh, Airspan is our radio provider for this release. Uh, we're doing 7-2 uh, split, and we're using CBRS in the U.S. Uh, outside the U.S., uh, it's it's still uh, private spectrum is being talked about, but um, and there's no clear standard. CBRS is a USA uh, only standard. And basically what CBRS is, is uh, a, um, a free block of spectrum that you just need to register with what's called a SAS service for your county, and you're entitled to use uh, CBRS in a certain band there for free. This is a uh, high-level topology of the design. Um, so on the right-hand side, we have the, uh, the network edge where it's on-prem, and we have Red Hat OpenShift running uh, the Litmus Manager Airspan ACP, which is uh, Airspan ZMS, uh, and then the Smart Edge controller. Uh, and then on top of that, we have a VM running uh, the Ironic Bifrost. Uh, the red arrow I have there is, is the 
the change that we did. So this slide already existed. Uh, the red arrow is, is where we uh, did new stuff to do this zero touch provisioning. The rest of the architecture, uh, if you were to go to the RA, you would see this slide without the red arrow. So the environment is using the latest version of the controller, which is 10.24, latest version of Smart Edge Edge Node, which is 5.6. Otherwise, you will not get the features I mentioned that get us at one step closer to zero touch. Um, we're doing a simple single node controller, uh, but our RA, the official release, and our deployment guide, we deploy the controller to OpenShift. Um, and as I mentioned, we use XR2420s in our example, but uh, the RA specifies uh, support for XR11, XR12. Uh, the actions that were taken uh, uh, to you know, build this presentation was to leverage Ironic's boot from virtual media, uh, to uh, activate the node via the REST API, and uh, you know, as I said, the remaining manual step is we um, get the entitlements from Intel, and then the node is ready to run. That is all I have for slides. Uh, does anybody have any questions for myself or Rick on, on Ironic or Akalash on Smart Edge or about uh, the new business unit at Dell? No questions? Okay. I hope it was interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, all of this stuff here is, is all public. You don't need any kind of... Uh, uh, credentials to get to it. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>